Look, I got my blue flag, red, black, and green. Same on material, just change the color skin. Different lyrics, same beat, change the thing. But no matter the song, it's still a hundred I put on. No kidding, like my pull out game strong. I push in my pull up game strong. I ain't talk about no gym. Before we get started today, please register with us at SanCoperGlobalExchange.com. We have live online classes to fill your every need for genealogy. We also offer how-to genealogy videos. Also, follow us on social media at The Ancestors Way on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. You can also add us on YouTube at Sankofa Global Exchange. Hit the bell, like, share, and subscribe. Hello, everyone. My name is Drake Reed, the founder of Sankofa Global Exchange. And today, we'll be talking to you about how to utilize genealogy to locate and build diaspora communities. But before I get into the presentation, I would first like to thank my ancestors for making this company possible and your ancestors for allowing you to join in this exchange. Get people from African descent affected by the Atlantic slave trade involved in Africa, you must identify their direct ancestors' hometowns. The bulk of the diaspora returning to the continent are pioneers and are Africans who left Africa on their own terms. To get the average person interested in Africa, they must know their family connection. Until the family connection is realized, the masses of the diaspora will feel as if these places are far-fetched, as many believe they may be native or other backgrounds. When a person knows the location of their family, they are more likely to come and want to be invested. Now it is possible to locate ancestral villages, hometowns, and or nomadic regions. Here's where we mm. go, the next level. If a person of African descent whose family history has been lost, they are from a specific country and or tribe in Africa, the pioneers will jump into action. When you tell someone that great great grandfather was an architect in a specific city or village in Africa, or how their great-great-great-grandmother was a healer in a specific city or village in Africa prior to slavery and colonization, the average person will jump into action. Put the names with locations, and they will come. It's so important to know your ancestors' names, and not just the names, but who they are, what they did, how they affect your life, why you're here. Now it's time for a story, an ancestor story. What about Lucinda Word? AKA Mama Cindy, my great 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 grandmother. Now, Mama Cindy was born to a Malian couple whose slave names were Jackson and Lizzie Jackson. Lizzie's Malian name was Kayton, and Mama Cindy's husband's name was Thomas Word II, AKA Papa Tom, my great 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 grandfather, who was also born to a Malian couple named Thomas and Annie Word. Now, Annie's Malian name was also Kayton, like Lizzie. The Keita name is one of the original Malian names. The most notable Malian name, Keita, was the Lion King, such as the Keita, who went to slavery in West Africa and created the Kurakan Fuga, which is the first constitution of West Africa. But unfortunately, Annie and Lizzie will be forced to change these names upon their arrival to America. Now, all four of my Malian ancestors, Thomas, Annie, Jackson, and Lizzie, were all captured in Kai Mali. They were all transported to Havana, Cuba. Then Thomas and Annie were split up. Thomas going to Galveston, Texas, and Annie going to New Orleans, Louisiana. Annie was sold to a plantation north of New Orleans where she escaped of the Mississippi River to West Helena, Arkansas. And Thomas was sold from Galveston Port to a slave owner in West Helena, Arkansas. Now, Mama Cindy told the elders in our family, the word name is a proud name. Now, Thomas had a slave owner who didn't allow his slaves to be married. But one day he became very ill to the point of near death. Now, Annie, she knew how to heal people using African herbs and African sciences that she learned in Mali. So she made a deal with the slave owner. Her and Thomas said, hey, you know, we'll heal you and get you back to 100%, but you have to allow us to be married. So, you know, reluctantly, the slave owner agreed. He said, all right, I'll let you all be married if you heal me. So they healed him, and once he got back to 100%, he kept his word and allowed them to be married. And that's why the names of Thomas and Annie Word changed their family name to Word. So that's why my family has the word family reunion. Thomas and Annie would then give birth to Papa Tom, who will marry Mama Cindy. 
my Mercedes parents followed the same route from Cobb Valley to St. Louis, Senegal to Havana, Cuba. They were also shipped from Havana, Cuba to Louisiana, then up to Mississippi to West Helena, Arkansas. Now, the story of Papa Tom and Mama Cindy epitomizes the power of love. Now, Papa Tom, he was a proud man, which was a dangerous mentality to have there in the 1800s. So dangerous that one day, some men tried to hang him. They tied him up in the noose, had his arms bound behind his back, and the only thing standing between him and sudden death was kicking the bucket that was under him. When Mama Cindy found this out, she rushed down there. She had a lantern in her hand. She rushed down to the barn where he was at with a shotgun. And she told those men, she said, hey, if you kill my husband, I'm going to throw this lantern in this tub of kerosene in here. And we all going to burn up tonight. So all those men, they had to cut Papa Tom down. And they freed him. And then her and Papa Tom went across the Mississippi River with all the kids. Moved everyone to Robinsonville, Mississippi. Now these stories, these stories of my ancestors, these, this is why I'm here today. This is why I'm alive. I know when I wake up every day, why I have to make every day count. And you will be able to know why you're alive today and why you got to make every day count. Because it's because of people like them that made this possible for you and I to be here. But you don't know. You need to know. It's time to know. Now let's go find some ancestors. All right, everyone. This is how it all started. We started off here in Kai Molly. My ancestors, Thomas and Annie Ward, start off in Kai Molly. They went up here to, through the Senegal River to an area called St. Louis, Senegal. They moved on from St. Louis, Senegal all the way across the ocean to Havana, Cuba. All right, I'm gonna back up so you can take a look at how far that is. So they made it to Havana, Cuba and Thomas Thomas was shipped from Havana, Cuba to Galveston, Texas, which is right here near Houston. Annie, she was sent from Havana to New Orleans. So we're down here in the South. Thomas is in Galveston, Texas. Thomas is sold all the way up to West Helena, Arkansas. All right, Annie, down here in New Orleans, she goes to a plantation just north of New Orleans and then she escapes up the Mississippi River. And she also ends up in West Helena, Arkansas. Now, there in West Helena, Arkansas, they had a child named Thomas Word. And Thomas Word would marry Lucinda Word. And those are my great grandparents from six generations ago. Now, Thomas Word and Lucinda Word, we call them Papa Tom and Mama Cindy. They're in West Helena, Arkansas. They have a situation that they need to escape across the Mississippi River. And they head over where Tunica is. During the time it was called Robinsonville, Mississippi, but now it's called Tunica. Later on, they will move a little bit further north up to Memphis. Now, Thomas and Lucinda Word had a daughter named Leanna Word. Now, Leanna Word, she moves a little bit further north to St. Louis. Now, in St. Louis, Leanna Word has Ida May Word. And Ida May Word has my grandmother, Leanna Word, who would marry my grandfather, Jefferson Turner, when they moved to Detroit. In Detroit, Jefferson Turner and Leanna Word have my mother, Daphne Reed. And then she meets my father, Carl Reed. Then they move back to St. Louis. Now that I've shown you our ancestral route from Kai Mali through Havana, Cuba to America, now we can take a look at it on paper. Using the systems at Sankofa Global Exchange, we've tracked our family back seven generations. The first Molly is to come to the United States in our family were Thomas Cater Word, Nanny Word, and also Jackson and Lizzie Cater Jackson. Those families had Thomas and Lucinda Word. Thomas and Lucinda Word had Leanna Word. Leanna Word begat Ida May Word. 
out of Midward begat Leanna Word Turner. Leanna Word Turner begat Daphne Turner Reed, who was my mother, and I am Drake Reed. To lay it all out on paper, the DNA goes from Annie Word to Lucinda Word to Leanna Word to Ida May Word to Leanna Word Turner to Daphne Turner Reed. Sacoma Global Exchange has several services. We offer a full genealogy service where we do the work for you. So if you're working a lot or if you don't have the, the interest in doing all the work, you know, then, then uh, contact us and then sign up for the full genealogy service and we'll use our entire team and uh, you'll have us at your disposal and we'll get it done. We also have Sankofa classes where we teach you how to complete your family research yourself. So if you're a person and you want to do the work yourself and you want to cross check and make sure it's all legit, then we will all, we have classes that you will love and you can uh, you can join and we'll teach you each step on how to how to accomplish that. Uh, we also have how to videos where we teach you how to begin if you're missing biological parents. So if you're an orphan or if you're missing one of your parents, your biological parents, then uh, we have some how to videos on how you can get started. And because a lot of people don't think that they can get started if they don't know uh, know a parent or two, but you really, but you can. What we all should know, your ancestral tribe, village, hometown, and or nomadic region, the first Africans in your family to arrive to the Americas and why, where the major branches of your family members are today, your direct ancestors' values, traditions, cultures, and spiritual sciences, your direct ancestors' achievements prior to slavery and colonization, and your tribe's current chiefs, kings, queens, etc. The key points for today's presentation is what is genealogy, DNA versus genealogy, your name, why it matters, and levels of genealogy. Genealogy is the study of family history, an account of the descent of a person and our family group from one ancestor to the next. DNA testing is part of the genealogy equation, but DNA is not genealogy in and of itself. DNA is your personal identification linking you to your ancestral lineage. When a company says they will help you with your genealogy, it does not necessarily mean they're going to DNA test you. DNA helps with broad geographical locations, but lacks the ability to pinpoint ancestral hometown. Now, DNA is a great starting point but more genealogical information must be gained to locate your ancestral hometown. Your job is not done in DNA. The name is the game. Regaining your African name means recapturing all that was taken. The questions become, what is your African family name? What does it mean to you? What will you do to find it? And what will you do with it once you have it? Having someone else's family name gives them a portion of credit for your achievements as your name identifies in family origin. It's time to find your African name. The average person goes out and they get a DNA test and then they, after they get the results and they find out they're from a particular country in Africa, they stop. The next level are the people that go and find census records. So they get the DNA test, they get census records and then they stop. Now, the intermediate level, that's when things get interesting. That's when you start locating unknown ancestors, people that you didn't know about. That's going to be a beautiful thing. For the advanced is when you start identifying your ancestral hometown in Africa. Identifying your ancestral hometown in Africa will basically put you back to where your ancestors were prior to the slave trade. And the elite level is finding your family prior to slavery and recapturing family names prior to leaving Africa. Do not, under any circumstances, let your elders pass without getting their stories. Now that you know a little bit about genealogy, how far would you go to heed your ancestors' call? Will you make the investment in them as they have already made the investment in you? Looking back on it, doing what I'm doing now, I never saw it coming. I was just a typical kid playing college ball, you know, looking to play pro. And it was, I was just taught all basketball all day. I had no idea that I would be leaving the country for any, any reason other than, you know, maybe going on vacation here and there, but I was totally stuck on hoops. 
And through my through my time playing professionally, I played on all six continents and uh, had an opportunity to visit twenty six countries. And it's been a it's been a blessing to be on all these places. But the one thing that stood out more than anything to me is just how many of us are all over the world. And in France, in particular, when I got to France, that was the place that really started my journey on this onto the ancestors. <laughs> being 23 years old and you know it was my first time you know with young kids just from the state like man I'm out of Paris you know it's 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 crazy you know but uh you know I noticed that it was so many African people there so many everyone on my team was from Africa or they were first or second generation you know born in Europe but their parents or grandparents were from Africa and then I had a bunch of guys on my team also that were from the Caribbean or from South America so it was just I was meeting people of African descent from all over the planet you know, all on one team, and then all on the other teams, everyone was from the same places. I began to notice so many things, such as I would go to museums, and I would, uh, I was like, hey, I'm going to another country. I want to see everything. I was going sightseeing. I was going to museums. And in these museums, I saw a lot of African deities in there. I saw a lot of statues of important African people, you know, from different parts of the world. And for, be, for me to be 23 years old, I have never seen anything like that, you know, growing up in the States it really started to play on my mind. And I started noticing in our conversations, you know, the majority of my teammates knew exactly where they were from, no matter what nationality they were. And I just, I was like, man, you know? a common question that's, that you're always asking outside of the States is where are you from and where, what's your origin? And I never really thought about the origin part. You know, I was like, you know, what, what's that? You know, but uh, being around guys from different places, it made me start to understand this origin piece is very important. And because of uh, because of our situation, how we were had to deal with the, the transatlantic slave trade, you know, our origins were lost. So I could never answer that question. And I noticed two guys in particular really started me on my journey. What I'm saying, Drake, man, what, what's this racism thing I keep hearing about? You know, and and I could believe that there's somebody you know from West Africa didn't know about slavery, you know, about slavery and racism. So I started breaking it down to them and explaining the things that happened in our country and the things that happened to my grandparents and great grandparents. And, and uh, he, he just, he was like, man, that sounds terrible. I never heard anything like that. And you know, I was just, co I was totally shocked. You know, I was totally put, put back that somebody grew up their whole life having no, having no concept of slavery, having no concept of racism in the way that we know it. And I began to pay attention to everyone. It's like, wow, you know, these guys, they don't have the same blocks on their mind as we do. And I wondered, you know, what would my life be like had I not known about these things? Had I not experienced some of the things that I experienced growing up as a kid and as a young adult? And the second question I was asked from another teammate of mine, uh, he was like, why do you say you're African-American? And so I was like, man, man, come on, man, stop messing with me. He's like, no, I'm serious. He's like, you know, because I'm not, uh, I'm from Senegal. I'm not from Nigeria. I'm not from South Africa. You know, don't call me African. You know, I, I'm Senegalese. And that really, that really stunned me because I never considered that. And then that's when I really understood that not knowing where you're from is a real problem. And, you know, I was like, man, you know, am I messed up? Those were my first, that was my early experiences of, of this journey. As the years went on, I would go play in some other countries. I would go play in, uh, in Austria and Italy and, and, uh, and Argentina. And I would play in the Middle East and, and North Africa. And I had a lot of different experiences. And, and periodically, I would have some experiences on and off the court that would all come down to me not knowing my origin. And it's like me not knowing my origin put me in certain situations that I was totally unprepared for. And because other people knew where they fit and they knew where I fit and I didn't know where I fit, um, I, I was at a disadvantage. So, you know, these type of things I didn't fully understand at the time, but it kept playing on me. And every time I would go to a new country, I would end up going back to France. I would go somewhere, something bad would happen, and I would go back to France. I'd go somewhere else, the things didn't work out, I'd go back to France. And after a while, my mind was like, hey, you know what? why do you think you keep going back to France so much more than other places? And I was like, you know, I guess it's basketball, you know, uh, maybe it's the best market for me. And so my mom said, no, 
no, it ain't that. It's something deep going on. And so uh, I, I didn't think much of it at the time. I was probably about 26 or 27 years old. And so around this time, I really started to watch different documentaries and, and shows about about your roots and knowing where you're from. And I noticed that this DNA testing just came out. So I took one. And when I got the results back, uh, it said that we're a Mandinkas. So I immediately started Googling the Mandinkas and started looking them up and finding out all the names, of all the great leaders that they had. And, and I noticed that my teammates had the same names as many of the leaders in the history of the Mandinkas. So I called them up like, hey, you know, you know these, you guys know these people? They're like, yeah, we're descendants. How do you know? How do you know all these stories? And I was like, man, that's crazy. You know, here I am in France and look at my brothers and sisters right in the face every day. And we don't know each other. And that's when it hit me that this is why I had to be in France more so than other countries, because I had to be around them. I had to know that they were my people when I was amongst my own people there. Another interesting experience I had the year before I went to West Africa for the first time, our teams would always have us go meet with uh, English speaking classes while we're in France. And so these kids would always ask us things about politics. They were asking about gun laws and different things going on in the States because they just wanted to have an understanding of the U.S. and you know what it's about. But this was the first season I ever played on a team with a guy that's a Native American. And so he was a really good guy, and, and uh, they were asking him about Native American culture and, uh, and his tribal history. And he could just break, he broke everything down, you know, all the good and the bad. And, and just watching him speak about his people with so much conviction, it made me feel like, man, I want to I want to be able to talk about that, about my people. Eventually, I got to the point where I had the opportunity to go to West Africa. And about a month before, I was totally... I was totally nervous about the whole situation because I wasn't going to hoop. I wasn't going on vacation. I was planning on going to the villages and meeting the chiefs and getting all the information that we missed out on, you know, from the slave trade. And around this time, I kept reading about, about the ancestors, ancestor this, ancestor that. You must pay homage to your ancestors. So one night I said, all right, I'm gonna put this to the test. So I said a prayer one night and I said to my ancestors that are my dickens, that are from the Senegal and Mali area in West Africa. Let me know if the information I have is true. And if I truly need to go to West Africa at the end of the season, make it obvious, make it plain. And so about a week later, I was in Paris in, a, in an area called Chaclet. And I walked into this African print store. And as I'm in the store, I noticed they have all of our history in there. They have all the African leaders from around the world, from every continent. They have all of the African garbs. And, but this is my first time being in a store like this, and I knew what I was looking at. So I started talking to the owner of the store, but I was like, man, you have all that history in here. And he said, you know, I'm, it's surprising the young brother from the States knows about all this because most of you guys, when you come in here, you don't know or you don't care. And I was like, well, you know, I used to be like that because I didn't know, you know, it's not really part of our curriculum in most of our schools. And, you know, but I've been in France for the last four or five years and most of my friends are African and I picked up on the culture and I plan on going next month. And in the back of his store, he has this large wall filled with ancestors. You know, as I'm talking, he cuts me off and he says, but when you go to Africa, it's going to be a powerful experience. But don't think it's by chance you came in today. And he raised his right arm towards that back wall. And he said, the ancestors sent you an invitation. And I was like, dang. <laughs> At that moment, I knew I had to go to Africa. What's up, everybody? I'm just in Chaclay. Out of the African store, it's called Soul Brothers. We have all our history up in here. All of them. Just a few minutes later, I'm in the same store. And I'm buying a book about Sanjata Keita, The Lion King. And as I'm buying the book about Sanjata Keita, there's a man who walks into the store, store and he starts talking to the owner of the store. And then the owner of the store looks at me, he says, hey, this is the guy who wrote the book. He's going to sign it for you. He's a man thinker. <laughs> I was like, <laughs> when the ancestors, when you call them, they will answer. I know that for a fact. <laughs> Oui, je parle français, c'est difficile pour moi. Non, c'est chiant euh, pour m'appeler euh, en français. Pour moi, uh, straight. <laughs> Ça, c'est pour le bon, quoi. So, I'm getting my book signed by the author of the Sanjata Hita book. 
Because I'm a man thing. <laughs> so it just so happened to just so happened to meet the author in the store. So what a day. I'm gonna ask for a better situation, a better story. So I go to synagogue first and synagogue was great. You know, I had a great time, I learned so much. But it's not until you're actually in a slave dungeon that you really understand the magnitude of what really happened. And through the explanations I was given, I really had a better understanding of what my ancestors went through. Well, you know, the question was always global. And we're gonna finish our tour with a door at the bottom that we call here the door of no return. Why is it called the door of no return? Because that when the slaves step out of the door, it means goodbye Africa. Because from the door, the separation was always total. Let me give you an example to make sure you understand what I'm saying. For the family, is a dad, a mom, a brother, and a sister. Easily, the father must be sent to Louisiana, in the States. Yeah. The mom took him to Cuba, the sister in Haiti, and the brother in Brazil. The family will be completely separate for life. Right. The whole, the whole trip to synagogue was kind of trippy because on one end, you see what happened to us through slavery. And on the other end, you go to all these great museums and you see how they're being educated there. And it's just, I was able to see what we've missed out on. Now, ain't that some taking all these young kids, all these young black kids, man, to go learn the history about themselves. That's powerful. But when I got to Mali, I just knew that Mali was it. When I got to Mali, I could feel it. The women looked just like my aunts, looked just like my mother. I mean, the facial structure, the way they're built, everything about them looked just like the women in my family. And I knew I was home. But when I got to, when I got to meet all of the chiefs, one in particular, this is when I knew why I had to be in France. So I'm in the, so I'm in there talking to the chief and he wasn't giving me a whole lot of information at first because, you know, he was like, oh, it's, it's just an American tourist guy coming down here. So he was kind of, you know, filling me out. But in my translator wasn't explaining the way that I needed him to explain. It was like, man. So it's like, it's like French just kicked on fluent. Because back then I could speak French, but not like I can now. It's just like automatic. I was like, boom, 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 telling them everything that I experienced that I've been telling you, plus a lot more other things. And eventually he stopped me, he said, say no more, I know you're one of us. And then he started breaking down the history for me from the beginning up to modern day. And this whole ancestral trip has just been phenomenal on so many levels. The biggest blessing was teaching this to my family. And it's healed us in ways that we still don't understand. When you take a look at this picture, the reason I'm standing backwards walking into the door is a signal to everyone who sought to destroy my ancestors and use and misuse them and mistreat them and show them that I came back to get it up. And now it's time for you to go back and get it up. Choose your ancestors today, and we will show you the way, the ancestors' way. Our next class is tomorrow, October 25th at 4 p.m. Central Standard Time. You can sign up at www.sankofaglobalexchange.com. You can also contact us at info at sankofaglobalexchange.com. We're also on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter at The Ancestors' Way. And we also have a YouTube page, Sankofa Global Exchange. Like, share, and subscribe. Be sure to enroll in our upcoming classes. Our next class is tomorrow, October 25th, and we'll be covering how to find your African village, Africans in the Americas, and family stories. And next weekend, we'll have another intro class covering flow charts, uncovering family secrets, and family libraries. And then November 8th, we'll be starting our advanced classes, and every week we'll touch on different subjects that address our family lineage across the water in Africa. And as a bonus for being part of this summit, we're offering you $25 off until 10 p.m. tonight for our class tomorrow. Now let's find some ancestors. Thank you for tuning in to this presentation of Sankofa Global Exchange. And thank you Black Sustainability Summit for allowing SGE to be a part of this exchange. Peace. <laughs>
Hello, everyone. Um, before we get started, we're going to have a little question and answers, a little Q and A. Um, but I want to I want to start off by thanking my ancestors for allowing this company to be possible, and also uh, thanking your ancestors for allowing you to be a part of this exchange. So, uh, whenever you guys are ready, I'm ready. All right. So I think that. Um... We did have some questions already going in the, the Hoover. Okay. Um, let's see here. So we'll go ahead and just allow for those who are live with us on the call to um, unmute themselves and ask their question. Is there anything from you? This is Nobody too. So what? What's the class cost tomorrow? He says $25 off. What is the cost? Uh, just go to the website and check it out. All the prices are up there. Uh, when you go to uh, www.sancofaglobalexchange.com, go into the class section and hit individual forms. And under individual forms, it'll have a list of every class we offer and how much the prices are. And um, for the for the, um, for the the price tomorrow, we've already included a, a link to where um, on that page where you can find a price. Well, thank you very much. And thank you for your presentation. It was profound. Um, I knew a person named Carl Word out of San Francisco who's probably around 73. You ever heard of somebody named Carl Word? No. How, okay. where, where is he located? Uh, I went to school with him in San Francisco and uh, he should be around 70, 73 years old at this point. I, I can I'll ask some of the elders in my family because there is a lot of words uh, that that uh, that are in their seventies and eighties that that know a lot of things. So I will ask about that name, Carl Word. Let me let me write that down. Uh, but thank you, but thank you for your compliments. You're welcome. Hi. Hello. Hi. This is this is Eray T. Hope um, from Dallas. Um, I was wondering, um, do you see the DNA testing as a part of the gene genealogical process now, or do you think it's not necessary? And I was wondering if you have any relationship with Ancestry, I mean, African AfricanAncestry.com as opposed to, uh, you know, Ancestry.com or, or 23andMe, because I think AfricanAncestry.com is owned in one of the, fir the first and owned by Black people. Okay, um, I'm going to answer the first one. The, the first one was, do I think that DNA and genealogy? Uh, so, so DNA is uh, is a part is a part of genealogy, but uh, as we covered earlier in the video, it's not the entire equation. So, most people get their DNA test and it says they're from Cameroon or they're from Liberia and they're a part of a particular tribe, and they think that's it. Well, that's not going to tell you, you know, who who the person was. That's not going to tell you, um, you know, where they lived and, and uh, you know, any of the specifics that, you know, that I've been able to mention uh, about, other, about other folks. So it helps you to get a, a broad sense of where your ancestors uh, were living prior to. But even, even that, you have to dig a little deeper because the locations can change depending on uh, the tribe and, and the migrations and things. But, um, but, but yeah, but as far as African ancestry, I do. I have known them for uh, many years, and uh, and they are an excellent company. Uh, they're actually one of our affiliates, and we also, uh, you know, we have a discount code on our website. If you ever do need a DNA test, you can go. Uh, you can go on our website, and and, uh, and it's under the services section. But uh, but uh, I prefer them more so than the others um, because they are specifically for people of African descent. So they have the most samples. They have the most. Uh, you know, other other companies. Are comparing you to a very small percentage of African African born people. So whereas African Ancestry has the largest database, so their answers are, are much more accurate. And I know that from experience um, of, of uh, not only you know my my uh, ancestral charts but other people's ancestral charts. Which, which companies did you have yours? Did you have yours done with African Ancestry, or uh, what company did you have done first? I did. Well, I did Twenty Three and Me. Um, I and I did uh, African Ancestry, um, and Twenty Three and Me was was pretty good, but the most accurate was uh, was African Ancestry for sure. Right, and they don't sell your information. Also, the other companies sell your information. 
that yeah, that's also to my knowledge. Yeah, that, that's also something else uh, that I was looking at as well because your DNA is your highest form of identification. It'd be like going out and, and giving someone your wallet, mm -hmm. you know, and, and and hoping that they do right by it. But uh, but African ancestry, they they right. uh, they don't uh, misuse your DNA. Yeah, I was hoping you would say that because uh, the the owner, I mean the the you know director came here to Dallas, and I was really impressed with her and and um and the work they're doing. And they say that they were the first that the other companies, the other non-black companies, stole their idea and started making money off of it. But Howard University was be, began began the idea of the you know the DNA research. Yeah, it's uh well they're they're definitely good people. You know, they're definitely good people. I've known I've known uh known them for quite some time. Uh but you know, people gonna people gonna compete. They're gonna, you know, they see you doing something great, they're gonna jump on the bandwagon. That's just that's business. Thank you. Asante, Asante Sana. Asante Sana. Any other questions? Hi Drake, this is Karen. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. A question, a question I have is how long was your journey for your research? Like once the light bulb went on and you decided, or not just decided, came in contact with your descendants in France, which led you to Africa. How long would you say that journey for you took? I mean, overall, the journey took about 11 years. But but before I, but I actually started really diving into it um, in my mid twenties, so about seven six seven years ago, um, I was really that's when I really dove into it hard, and um, and after that, when I was able to uh, you know create a nice system to uh, once I started doing my paternal side of family, I was able to finish that in a week. So um, you know when you starting off. I was just interested. I wasn't totally, you know, I, I didn't even really understand genealogy in the beginning. I was like anybody else. Let me get my DNA test. You know, let me do what everyone else is doing. But, uh, you know, but I kept pushing on. Oh, I need to go. I need to go there. And because I was around a lot of African guys every day, you know, the questions and the things I needed to answer, they were answering, you know, I'm around them every day. So anytime something will come up, I would just ask them and then being able to speak uh, another language allowed me to understand more than had I not, because most people overlook the uh, the, the other country. It, like if it's not an English speaking country, if it's not Ghana or Liberia or somewhere where people speak English, most people from the States are totally shut off. You know, they're like, I don't understand them and this and that, but the the reality is uh, the British don't don't control, you know, uh, the majority of the, of the West African countries. They're, they're, the majority of them are controlled by the French. So if you're not if you're not willing to learn another language or you're not willing to, you know, Google Translate or, or do other things, then you're very limited because the the bottom line is your your family uh, the chances of your family being taken by the British uh, is is much smaller than than uh, than someone else. Thank you. Mm -hmm. How long has your company been running? Uh, well, we're fairly new, uh, but I've been doing genealogy and genealogy charts and stuff for six years. Okay, very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so, yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, go, go, go ahead, sister. I just wanted to, to um, ask him, uh, are you saying that the French and the British, they still own those parts of Africa? Well, I mean, now, you know, everyone's claiming their independence, uh, but they still have, you know, a stronghold on a lot of those countries because of colonization and some of the uh, the, the colonization pacts for the mm -hmm. continuation of it uh, in, in many of the West African countries. So um, some places are doing better than others, but, you know, it's been an uphill battle for quite some time. Are you saying financially or um, culturally? Uh, culturally, um, from the places that I've been, you know, I've been to six countries in Africa. I mean, most places culture is, is pretty intact, but there is a, a heavy influence from uh, from foreign countries, you know, through, uh, you know, through colonization and then just from people traveling, you know, foreigners traveling there, here and there, you know, it's the same as if you come to, to the States, you have a lot of people that's from here, but there's a lot of people from other places. So, uh, you know, it's 
it's like now when, when I come and I come home and I see the name of a neighborhood, it might be have an Italian or a French name or, or a Spanish name. I got see it right away because I lived in a lot of these places. Um, it's the same when you go to Africa. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, yes, greeting bro greetings, brothers. G good presentation. Thank you. Okay. Um, there's a... Uh, when you mentioned AfricanAncestry.com, I believe the the brother who uh, started the company was a geneticist. I forgot his name, but he was the gen geneticist in charge of the research at Howard University for the uh, remains of the African ancestors who were discovered uh, in the African burial ground in New York City smack in the middle of uh, City Hall. They found, uh, it was back in the 80s, uh, there was, they was um, doing excavation for the construction of a federal building. And uh, they, found, they found the remains of some of the ancestors. Of, and their plan was basically just to continue digging and, and basically, uh, you know, cover over over that but there were activists such as um uh Sonny Carson and a whole group of activists of along with with him they literally laid their laid their bodies down in front of the bulldozers to keep them from from uh ex excavating further um from there it became a of save up until 2003 uh, it's been a struggle because the federal government back then and to this day of uh, take the position that those the remains of those ancestors are federal property. But um, of over, they and they were disrespected in every kind of way. The remains were wrapped in in newspaper of. of you know, put you know, put away in in some place where where they would deteriorate further. But it was through the work of of uh, the activists involved that they not only preserved them, uh, but they managed to get their remains to Howard University. And it was the geneticist who's the founder of uh, African African ancestry, who did an analysis of um, <clears throat> of uh, you know their 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 physical structure, and they found that they had physical structures which were superior to um, the physical structures of any other race of people at that time. They they said that there were special formations in the shoulder blades, which allowed them to withstand more weight. Uh, so they they found they found that there, and they found it in the anatomy of of uh, their necks, where they where they were physically able to to um withstand you know more weight when they carry um of uh, it was him and it was also another anthropologist who, whose name escapes me but uh you know i just wanted to you know put that out there uh transatlantic productions they uh they uh video documented the event because after of uh, after the decades long research that took place, the activists, they, they organized uh, a ceremony where they literally uh, built uh, wooden, wooden uh, ceremonial coffins, about 300 of them. And they were like half the size of a regular coffin. And they literally packed them inside of a horse, horse, horse and buggy carriage of like the kind that they used during the uh, funerals back in the day. And they would take them off on a five city journey to, uh, to go along the same path as the Underground Railroad. So they started from Howard University in Washington, DC. Then from there, they went to um, Baltimore, to um, a church in Baltimore, then the church in um, Delaware, in Wilmington, Delaware, then uh, to the famous Masonic uh, Church 
in in Philadelphia by the old city than to than to Newark than New York, and um, they one by one they they the entire the, there was thousands of people there, and they all took turns to um, to bury them in this one like half a block uh, site that they reserved after they built the uh, federal building. So that's where they have their monument. But it was it was a very impressive um, ceremony, like a five city ceremony. I mean, I'm and, glad they were able to save uh, to save all the bodies. That that was a uh, that was big. Yeah, yeah. There's there's also another organization uh, called um, Afrocentricity International, and they work in Philly. And they found uh, they've been working in the Germantown area because they discovered an African uh, burial ground site uh, in that location. And there was a lot of there was a lot of struggle back and forth. In fact, um, some of the developers who uh, considered them a nuisance was caught on Mike under his breath to uh, basically threaten one of the activists uh, behind behind it. But um, you know, there's a lot of history behind streets we walk down and don't have a clue. Indeed. For sure. Thank, thank you. you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Were there any? Uh, thank you for your questions and your input. Um, yeah. are there any, is anyone else that have any questions? Yes, I have a question. Yeah. Um, during the time of Pangea, it's a it's known fact that our people are expanded all over the continents. Would you say that we still have ties to all these continents to this day? Like personally, because I think that um, based on our past, we have a lot of ancient past in every continent that exists. So it's like, wouldn't you say that we also have ties in those areas as well? Now, this ties a lot of places. Um, I mean, I was just in a in a museum a few months ago, um, in uh, on the in the west uh, in in the Rockies, and there was a Native American museum, and they had a bunch of uh, a bunch of uh, African artifacts in there showing the, the connection between the tribe, the, the Native American tribes, and, and the African tribes. So, I mean, you know, if you go back far enough, you're going to find all kinds of things. But I think, uh, but, but uh, you know, for my company, we focus on the areas that we miss because you can, once you find the location of where your ancestors are from down to the hometown. So if you, you know, no different than if, uh, you know, if you find out you're from New York or you find out you're from LA, the history uh, that, that's going on there, you can figure that out because you know the location. But the problem now is, is uh, everyone, you know, everyone who was separated in the transatlantic slave trade, you know, that hundred or two hundred or however many hundred years we were separated from, that's missing and we fill in those gaps. So that's that's the area of concern that we focused on. Okay, cool. There's a question really quick. I just don't want to lose sight of those who wrote their Thank questions. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, oh well Miss uh Miss Vivian, you're also in here and I see you wrote in the Hoova. Do you want to just go ahead and ask your question? Yes. Um I wanted to ask Drake what side of the family do you uh, you suggest doing first, the maternal side or the paternal side? I would say uh, whichever side you, you want to know, you want to dive into first. Um, and then whichever one uh, also, if you if you know, um, if you know more of the elders on one one side uh, more than the other, then I would start there because I've been I've been really hard on people about you know, you have these elders in your family that's 80 or 90 years old and you're not talking to them. And so what you're doing is you're losing large chunks of your family his, uh, history that's sitting right there in, in the living room and you're not saying nothing. So you need to, you need to uh, learn as much as you can from them about their history, you know, what happened with their grandparents and their great grandparents because they know a lot of things that's going to open the doors for you. So I would say start off with the side of the family that has, um, you know, elders that you're in contact with and, and even if there's other family members that know other elders that's 80 years old or, or, or more, just start with them because you need to take advantage of the time they have left for sure. And if we wanted to do the uh, research with your company, mm -hmm. what is the info? Give me one thing that would be very important for us to know that you will need in order to do the research. I'm a family historian also, I'm 72. But I do document uh, history and go way back. I 
talk with the elders. At the time, I, I was not an elder, but I am an elder now. Mm. You, uh, well, your question was, what's one thing yes. that we need to, need to know? Yes, you would need to know in order to research, uh, to do the research you, you need. Uh, just one, just one question, one answer. Um, to be able to get to the name, uh, my family African name. Oh, uh, to get to the name. The, to get yes. to the African name, we actually, uh, that's actually uh, our, our class tomorrow, we'll be explaining all of that. So I would say, you know, get into our class and we, we're going to, we just finished the slides, you know, a few, uh, a little while, a few days ago. It, it's going to be, oh. so. so uh, but I, the class is going to be here. It's going to be here. So uh, my class is going to be virtually tomorrow, you know, on, oh, okay. on, on, uh, on, on another platform. But, uh, okay. But uh, I, I would say to get in that class, and, and we're gonna we're gonna cover those type of things. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Are there any other questions? Sorry, I'm on mute. Here I go. So, Laura, you asked the question in the Hoover. Would you like to unmute yourself and say it here, or? Sure. Um, thank you for your presentation and I wish you continued success with your organization. It's so needed. Um, I was just curious to know what efforts are actively happening in the motherland currently to preserve data and records. Um, is there an importance to protect the records by say the country's governments or NGOs, um, just to know that it's being preserved within the motherland. Okay, so um, one thing you have to understand is, uh, for instance, in my culture, um, in Mali, we, uh, we're, we're taught in Yama, you know, amongst the Mandinkas. And so in Yama is the vital force of life. So once you taught something verbally, you know, orally, then you're, uh, it activates a portion of your spirit that allows you to remember uh, throughout generations. So, um, and in and, and, and Mali, as well as a lot of other countries in Africa, um, so, so many things are oral because that's the way we, our ancestors were taught how to remember. So many of the things that have been documented are come from someone who was taught an oral, uh, the oral history and they remember things that, you know, 10,000, 50,000, 100,000 years ago that will continuously pass down because through Nyama, Okay, when someone teaches you something verbally, the way that, that they speak and the tone in which they speak of it allows you to remember better than had you have read it. So one of the thing, one of the hurdles that a lot of people, uh, you know, just can't get over is that it's not on paper. You know, but when you look into uh, when you look into your uh, your African, uh, you know, heritage, you need to you need to keep that in, into uh, into consideration. So there are some there are some documents. There are uh, there are places that safeguard uh, certain things, but it just depends, uh, you know, who, who conquered the country, who's in control of the country, and if, and if those things, uh, you know, are still in existence. But um, many things are, can, are still uh, very well known in Africa on the continent. I have a question. Um, this Thank, is, you. Uh, Thank you. And I think we just have time for one more, and then we can continue the conversation in the Hoover. This is Lobanto. I have a question about, um, whether or not you have been um, to Timbuktu and are you aware of all the documents that have been hidden um, probably in, in the earth or underneath uh, the pat pallets? Are you familiar with that at all? Um, I, I've not been to Timbuktu yet because there's been so much, uh, so many troubles in the north. I had every intention of it. So, you know, it's, it's not safe to go to the north. Uh, you know, it's been that way for, you know, the last few years or so. Um, but yeah, I am very aware of the documents and the and the, uh, and the scrolls and things that are, that uh, that they have there. Uh, but a lot of them have been destroyed, you know, because of uh, because of the, uh, the insurrections and things that are going yeah. on. And there's a lot of uh, you know documents that are just laying in people's houses, or someone has it in their closet or something, you know, to hold on to. So that's going on in a lot of countries, um, you know, throughout Africa and just not Africa, but throughout the world. So um, you know. A lot of things, uh, you know, could be just sitting up, just like your family history could be sitting up, sitting around in your grandmother's box, you know, that she haven't touched in 50 years, you know, so it's a lot of that going on. Right. With the technology we have now, um, before the, these pieces of paper turn into ashes or dust, uh, 
we need to be scanning them uh, as much as possible. Definitely. So do you, do you have information on uh, storage? You know, I have documents I, I want to store it so they don't get destroyed. Um, are you, with your genealogy knowledge, um, are there special um, boxes or uh, in clay, in, you know, enclosures that you can put uh, documents, historical documents in? The, the, the best, um, as far as storing phys physical documents, uh, I would say that um, you, you will probably need to uh, maybe even laminate some of them uh, if, you, if possible. Um, I, I, would, I, would, I would say ask someone, maybe a librarian or somebody who handles those type of things to handle physical documents. But if you want to uh, store them, on, the, best, the, best, uh, the best software that I've used is McKee. And uh, that way you can, if you take a picture off, you scan anything, they have a, they have a, um, you, you can file everything there on, on their software and it's gonna, it's gonna stock, stockpile everything that you put on their pictures, documents, uh, you know, any kind of information, you know, maps, all kinds of things you can put on there. And, uh, and then, you know, in 200, 300 years from now, the information that you record, you can just, you know, somebody will have it on the jump drive and they can just pop it right in. Okay, so um, external uh, drive, would, would, would that be better than this program you're talking about? You can also just create a file on your computer and organize it however you see fit. You know, you could put, um, you know, census records on one, in one folder. You can put marriage license in another folder, you know, uh, you know uh, elder conversations in another folder, and just, and, and you can stockpile it that way and put it on external hard drive. But you always want to have a backup, you know, you want you want to put it on two or three external hard drives because one of them could get messed up, you know, or corrupted. Somebody could try, you know, it could be a fire. Someone could steal something. Like you just always want to have multiple copies so that uh, because it's your it's your family history, it's everything that that encompasses you and your being. I appreciate that. Uh, thank you for your response, and good luck to you and your classes. And as you move forward. Um, it's just really great to know that somebody's out there doing the work that you're doing. Thank, Thank you. you. Well, thank you, everyone. Look, I got my blue flag, red, black, and green. Same old material, just change the color scheme. Different lyrics.